Good afternoon and welcome to Round the Table. I'm Ben John from Christian Concern and delighted to be joined by Tim Diet uh, from Christian Concern and God willing, uh, we will be joined uh, by Andrea Williams. Hi Tim and Andrea, lovely to have you both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's always great to have you joining with us on Round the Table, uh, listeners, viewers. Uh, we always love to hear from you, so do remember to be putting in your comments, your questions, your concerns, your queries, your encouragements, whatever they may be. Uh, we always love to hear from you as we think about some of the big uh, topics of the week. Um, Andrea, we'll come to you then. So Felix and Gole's case finished this week. Tell us about that. Well, Felix and Gurley's case has been going on for many years now, as I know that many of the Christian Concern family know they've been following his amazing story. He's a, he's a great guy. He was an asylum seeker from Cameroon, has worked caring for people for the last 20 years of his life or even more. He's 48 years um, of age. And I think that you will all, be, uh, all remember that a number of years ago, um, he was at Sheffield University. He was there a social work student. And whilst he was on his course during, uh, during that, he, had, he um, started to have a Facebook discussion on marriage. One of his students, um, she um, reported him um, because she didn't like what he was putting uh, on, the, on the Facebook with regard to that. It was, it was absolutely just upholding biblical, biblical viewpoint on marriage. He was reported to the course instructor. And then he, in the end, in, essentially was removed from the course as unfit to be a social worker because the view was that a potential service user might view him as discriminatory, that a view, his viewpoint might be discriminatory. <laughs> We appealed that decision. We lost at the Employment Tribunal, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, but it was ultimately um, in the, the Court of Appeal that we uh, found that we were then um, able to um, get a judgment which was in favour of Felix, which said that for holding and manifesting those views um, as a Bible believing Christian about marriage, that he did not discriminate. Indeed, that on the basis of the way in which he'd been thrown off the course, uh, in essence, Mother Teresa herself wouldn't have been uh, a, a student um, able to be on the, the course at Sheffield as a social worker. So that case we won, and that case is indeed precedent setting and is quoted and is, is studied across the country, but is also quoted in many cases now uh, around the protection of Christian freedoms to live and speak out, for Christians to live and speak out their faith in, in public life. And so we were thinking, fantastic, Felix is able now to get on and do his work, do his job. He then applied for a job with a um, agency, a touchstone agency in Leeds. This was a job that was to do with Re housing, rehabilitating, putting, putting into the community uh, men and women who had had mental health issues and they were then being essentially housed in back into community, into real life and looked after. He passed the interview process with absolute flying colours. He was the, the standout favourite candidate. He was offered the job. However, ha after having been offered the job, and during the process of taking up references, the employer noticed uh, or Googled him and discovered the social work story, discovered what had happened at Sheffield. Because I'm, I perhaps I didn't finish that he'd gone on after he'd been uh, found not to have discriminated. He went on and qualified as a social worker. So he, when they found that, they called him to another interview and said, we really can't offer you this job because somebody with your views may well put off service users. Somebody with your views, we, we think would discriminate against service users. We can't essentially have someone with your views working in our agency. And as a result of this, um, they withdrew the job offer. We then 
proceeded to bring the agency to, to court in order to test this again because you see it's a really important freedom principle can we imagine that for your christian views as expressed or <coughs> described on social media your christian views people will then be at, withdraw jobs because they say your christian views are discriminatory in no, it's fact clear, it's clear discrimination against christians isn't it andrea They've clearly that, said, oh, because you've got these views, because you are uh, have Christian beliefs, we can't employ you. Well, that, that is, that, that, that's the case, isn't it? The discretion well, it went is, even, it, and it went even further than that in this particular case. They said, somebody with your views, because people mm -hmm. like you, because mm -hmm. of people like you, the LGBT community, as they would describe, as they were describing them, uh, would, they may commit suicide if they know that someone like you is going to be looking after them and of course this is this is so a, what a, you have to prove in court is that holding christian beliefs isn't dangerous to other people i mean that's it's extraordinary isn't it you're having to prove in court now that holding christian beliefs isn't dangerous to other people won't cause other people to commit suicide i mean that that's actually what and you had expert witness come in didn't you to you know with Solins, isn't it professor Solins, to come in and give evidence to show that holding Christian beliefs doesn't cause people to commit suicide. You know, and I think Felix de Gaulle said himself, if it was really true that my beliefs cause people to commit suicide, there'd be lots of people who had committed suicide already, and there's no evidence anybody ever has. You know, so it, it is extraordinary position to be put in, but of course it's a real case, and that is really the legal argument they're using, that this actually would endanger people's lives, him holding these views. And so it's a very important case because if we lose, that's very significant. You know, somebody holding Christian views can be barred from all sorts of employment because there are risks to other people just for holding Christian beliefs. Whereas if we win the case, again, that's very significant as well because they can't discriminate against Christians just because we hold orthodox Christian views on sexual ethics. And so it's it's absolutely a vital, important case, I think, to hear, isn't it? Yeah, well, and I, think the other, I mean, the other thing that was, I mean, the other the evidence that was coming out was this, of course, as well, that... I mean, Felix showed this incredible track record of ha having helped and cared for hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of people. In fact, all the feedback is extraordinarily positive with regard um, to Felix. Um, but Paul Sullins, Professor Paul Sullins' evidence also showed, sadly, that within the those identifying as LGBT, there is a higher suicidality risk and rate. But it's not because of people holding Christian views. It's actually because of social isolation, drug addiction, substance abuse, and so on and so forth. There's the, there are the other factors. The mental health that, you know, and, as well. and, and actually saying this as truth and showing this as social science. And of course, the, the, the expert that they brought in was someone who was not able to speak to this, who showed that he... Anything that he was saying was entirely anecdotal and there was no social science to back up his position. So we lay bare that argument that is continually put into the public space is that Christians simply for being Christians and holding these views render vulnerable, make mm. more suicidal groups mm. with whom the, the, the Christian view of how to live that, that yeah. with that, that the way in which they dispute it, that that, that Christian view of, of how to live is the thing that makes them suicidal. Yeah. So um, that was. I, I gather in court, Andrea, didn't somebody claim that John three sixteen could trigger someone? Yes, yes, yes. One of the one of those that had interviewed, um, uh, one of those that had interviewed, <coughs> excuse me, um, Felix and Goni said that 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 was triggering. Yes. And, and what was the and, reaction? And to that? What was the reaction to that in court? Well, I think you've got to understand, Tim, it's not that this is laughed out of court. No. <laughs> you've got to understand that the judge... You are the... laughing now, yes, I know. No, take notes. Yes. Everything is taken down very seriously. Yes. You've got to remember that in the case of David Mackerath, the doctor who wouldn't say on a medical certificate that a man was a woman or a woman is a man, that... The, Genesis one itself was in dispute in that in in in, in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yes, they actually ruled that belief in Genesis one twenty seven 
was a violation of other people's human rights, just the belief. I mean, that did get overturned in the end, but it's extraordinary that a judge would say that. So, I mean, very interesting judgment to read. Will they reference John 3.16? I mean, that'd be a very interesting judgment to read. Great to see some of these comments uh, coming in. Um, uh, Heather Scammell asking the question, do they employ people of other faiths with similar moral values? Um, um, Andrew, I don't know if that was addressed in the... Well, I think one of the interesting things that came up um, with regard to the Touchstone Agency in Leeds was this, that um, it was something like almost 40% of the staff were LGBT. So, um, but I 40%. think... 40%. Yes. 40%. 31%. <laughs> Yeah, like but I think, but I think 10 the other, times the national average. <clears throat> but I think the other thing that we need to say, um, more generally, um, to 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 um, the the lady that posted that comment was, is really this that, you know, at the Christian Legal Center we have a thousand case inquiries. What is our reality? What is our truth? Is that uh, Muslims in this country, and we love our Muslim neighbor at Christian Concern. We love our Muslim neighbors. But we do want to say, we do want to expose religions that are false, ideologies that are false. So we do want to contend on that. But, it, but what's absolutely fascinating in the public space is that, that Muslims tend to be favoured, tend to be treated as a group that are favoured. So in the court where we were, there was a prayer room. It wasn't a chapel. It was a prayer room, which was for the use of well, I presume it would. They would say for everyone, but who is making mm -hmm. use of that room? Mm -hmm. The Muslims are making use of that room. Mm -hmm. It's it's the, the prayer mats in the room. It's not crosses in the in the room anymore. These these are our realities of what's going on. And what's also very interesting, you can look at um, the postings of somebody like Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor, or Humza Youssef, um, First Minister in Scotland, and you will see there that. There is a, an ability to hold together the promotion of LGBTQ rights, mm. um, as well as saying I am an, a Muslim, mm. and and saying Happy Eid, uh, breaking iftar, prayer, uh, Muslim prayers are permitted, Christian prayers um, are prescribed, and that's what we're seeing generally uh, increasing. And and I really believe that this this year we've seen it's. There's, it's been a real tipping point this year for the for the the profile and the demand that there has been in public life over Easter to see Ramadan Eid proclaimed, and I think there's all it's felt almost as if there's been more public presence, particularly in the streets of London. Mm. of Eid than Easter in mm. terms of the symbols mm. that you're seeing, in terms of the images that are on public buildings. Of course, I don't want to go too far. Look at all the churches that there are in London. Look at all the amazing Easter services that there were in London. Yeah, so, so I don't want to go too far, but I'm just saying, I suppose, as a culture watcher, that that was very clear to me this year. Yeah. Uh, good to see some of these other comments coming in. Carol Donaldson, Carol Donaldson, as a Christian, Felix could be caught subjecting clients to gratuitous, discriminant compassion. Heaven forbid, I think. Uh, Sean Redfern, amazing that the promise of eternal life in John 3.16 could supposedly prompt someone to fear for their life. Um, Jacqueline Abel there, not to mention shame as a reason for suicide. It's interesting on the all these claims about uh, maybe we'll talk about this as well in, in the next segment about what leads people to take su to commit suicide completely goes against and any all the advice from Samaritans on media reporting and things like that about how claiming so X, Y and Z will lead people to suicide it actually creates a momentum effect and an association and a contagion where people who are experiencing X, Y and Z think oh, because there's this connection, I need to commit suicide. And so actually, it's all those who are saying that which I think is causing the harm for those who are struggling with sexual gender issues and things like that to say, oh, you're going to commit suicide unless we affirm you is causing them uh, to commit suicide. So we we, we, we need, need, need to be um, speaking out uh, about that. Um, 
Moving on, um, Tim, a big review, landmark review was published this week. Tell us about that. Yes, so the CAS review uh, finally published, much anticipated, um, into general identity services for children and young people. And um, it really is a landmark review because it marks the death of affirmative approaches to care of children um, with um, gender questioning, gender confusion, all of that kind of stuff. And that has been the standard approach now for too long across the NHS and across the country generally that clinicians have felt like they have to affirm a young child in their chosen gender rather than you know, approach it scientifically, approach it methodologically, ask questions, query what else is going on, look at other mental health issues. And many of these people have many other mental health related issues as well. Um, and so um, the NHS is abandoning this long-held affirmative approach to care. And they're also, for children, are also launching a massive new review into adults' uh, care for transgender people as well. And the big thing she says, the, the big thing she sort of hangs her hat on is the reality as she, we have, she says, is we have no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions to manage gender-related stress. And she says children have been let down it's an increasingly toxic, ideological and polarised public debate. And um, people have been vilified on social media. Name calling is the worst bullying behaviour. This must stop. Um, and so she's saying there's just no good evidence and, and we can't just give people these puberty blocking drugs, which had already come out earlier in her interim review that she didn't like puberty blocking drugs. Um, it's now even stronger in this full review. And it, it's, um, it's an a, a extreme caution I would say we just should ban it, but it's, it's extreme caution is the next best thing to banning it. And um, the government have said they're going to also apply that to private clinics as well, because there's a lot of talk about, well, fair enough for the NHS, but private clinics can carry on. Well, the government's saying no, private clinics, we will expect them also to abide by this and not prescribe um, puberty blocking drugs to children as well. Um, so... Um, and it's very interesting because, you know, the lack of evidence um, is a clear thing that she talks about all the time in this report. That's the really the, the, the big thing. We do are not doing evidence based medicine and we really need to do evidence based medicine. That's what medicine is meant to be evidence based. And for example, she says the percentage of people treated with hormones who subsequently detransition remains unknown due to the lack of long term follow up studies. Through that there is suggestion that numbers are increasing. Well, of course, we supported um, James Caspian, who applied to study transgender regret at Bath Bar University and was turned down. And the reason he was turned down was because Bath Bar University said this is politically incorrect research, which could lead to attacks on social media and harm the university's reputation. So not because it's not a worthwhile area of study, not because too many people already studied it, not because, oh, that's a boring subject, you know, and it's not really qualified. No, because we don't want to, you know, damage our reputation by studying something that's politically incorrect. So I hope that uh, from this CAS review, we get a lot more studies into detransitioning, transgender regret, and that people like James Caspian are able to carry on and do their studies. Um, and then there's a whole another area, which is the whole area of conversion therapy, which gets mentioned in the review. And um, although she says she doesn't agree with conversion therapy, she makes very, very clear that accusations of conversion therapy are a problem uh, for clinicians. And she says, and I quote, concerns were expressed about potential accusations of conversion practice when following an approach that would be considered normal clinical practice when working with any other group of children and young people. In other words, if you don't affirm a child in their chosen gender, you could be accused of conversion practice and there's a professional ban on conversion practice as it stands today, and clinicians are terrified of breaching that professional ban, um, and therefore, you know, very concerned about you know not being able to properly question the children and properly ascertain what's going on, um, and feeling like they have to affirm it. Well, you know, gladly following this review, that's going to come to an end, um, and we've already seen the um, National Council of um, Psychotherapists pull out of the Memorandum of Understanding on conversion therapy, I think we may see more organizations pull out of it. You can't have the NHS signing up to this MOU when CASA said this causes clinicians to be afraid of accusations of conversion therapy. Um, so 
I think that may well change as well. I think the repercussions from this are still coming. They're going to continue. And it, it has really landed a massive blow to the whole transgender ideology. You're seeing lots of people and organizations rapidly backtracking on their support for transgender ideology, particularly for children, which is what this report focuses on. On suicide, uh, we talked about suicide earlier in relation to Felix de Gaulle and that. She says this, tragically, deaths by suicide in trans people of all ages continue to be above the national average, but there is no evidence that gender affirmative treatments reduce this. Such evidence as is available suggests that these deaths are related to a range of other complex psychosocial factors and to mental illness. So she's saying, yeah, people are using this gender affirmative approach because they're worried about suicide. Oh, I have to affirm them on their gender, otherwise they commit suicide. And she said, that is not, there's no evidence to support that, that actually affirming something is going to reduce the suicide risk at all, therefore discount that completely. And that's a, a big thing for her to have said, very significant. Really, I think she really has dealt a, a death blow to affirmative approach uh, for children presenting as um, you're with gender dysphoria who want to change gender. And I think that's a massive step forward in this whole area. And as I said, the repercussions will continue to be felt um, right throughout this country and even across the world as well, because it's a landmark study, nearly 400 pages altogether. A lot of evidence has been put together. A lot of things are cited and we will continue to see the repercussions of it for some time to come. Andrea, what do you hope to see? Well, the, this, the, 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 the recommendations in this report that they will be implemented, that there will be an end to socially transitioning children to puberty blockers being prescribed, indeed to any hormone uh, hormones being prescribed to children. But I think the shift that we've seen even almost immediately is now towards adults. Isn't mm. that interesting? Mm. And indeed, you know, and I want to say as well, well done to the Christian Concern and Christian Legal Centre team. We have been there right from the very beginning when we were called transphobic and bigoted for raising these issues, for raising the dangers that there were to children in schools. Indeed, it was Nigel and Sally Rowe for speaking out so early and bringing their case that forced the government to look um, at rewriting its guidelines that essentially applied the pressure um, around um, in this area, really, um, to force, uh, I would say, the NHS and into a review uh, of this. So I well done to this team. Well, that, that relates to, because obviously the government did bring out draft guidance for schools on gender questioning yes. children that was quite strong in December. And it was, but it was draft guidance subject to consultation. The consultation, we responded to it. The consultation has now ended. Now the cast of you has come in prior to the government bringing out actual, you know, full guidance here, the actual authoritative guidance. And I think the CAS review doesn't actually talk very much about schools other than to mention bullying in schools, but the influence of the CAS review in terms of criticizing, affirming children has got to boost the government saying no child should be allowed to identify as the opposite gender. Particularly well, let's just think child. also, Tim, we've got the case of Hannah. Yep. Looking mm. after lovely little eight-year-olds. Yeah. And yeah. raising with all the evidence Raising essentially, she raised the CAS report. I mean, the, the evidence that we have submitted, the evidence that there is there in the public space, we've put into the mm -hmm. court records. Mm -hmm. but, we've, um, the, but she raised those issues with the head teacher. Still, they continue to affirm. Still, that local authority continues. Well, so, so, just to so our listeners all know, you know, an eight year old was wanting to transition gender and she raised concerns about, you know, ha has there been a safeguarding analysis? You know, do we know that this is, you know, from a safeguard perspective, the right thing to do? And the school dismissed her as being transphobic for even raising that suggestion. Now, that case um, is has been heard, hasn't it? Are we waiting for a judgment on it? Am I right on that? And we, no, well, there we found that uh, the, the the judge and one of the wingers had showed themselves to be biased in terms of Oh, their, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we've act, so that's yeah. the other thing that we've seen that also in the case of Christy Higgs, the case of Bernard yeah. Randall. I mean, all yeah. of these cases, a lot of, I'm and sure. Felix Ngole, not to mention and as well. Felix Ngole, and um, yeah. yes. so, so we've also got the case live of Joshua Sutcliffe again, one of the early high profile cases. I mean, he has lost his job for life within the teaching profession. He's had mm. his teaching license removed mm. indefinitely. And we've got that, we've got an appeal on that case coming up in. Yeah. It's worth just clarifying so our listeners and viewers totally understand what we were saying there. So in the recent, in the case of Hannah, 
who'd raised those, raised those safeguarding concerns, the whole case has been pushed back a year or so because the tribunal recused themselves because they were found, one of them was found to be an LGBT activist. In the case of Felix and Gole, just last week, a panel member recused because found to be an LGBT activist. And in the case of Christy Higgs. And too. in the case of Christy Higgs. And so actually, and, and that's because they've been found to be that. Um, mm -hmm. How often in our cases, we don't know because it hasn't been found, are, you know, it's because we've managed to find that there are, that they were these things. Whereas, you know, and oftentimes people take all these cases, they maybe read the papers and think it's all very neutral. Uh, what it's well, you know, the Felix Ngole case, the Christy Higgs, the Hannah case, could have gone a particular direction and we wouldn't have been, been none the wiser that um, uh, there was that. But there was uh, absolute bias on the bench. And I think that we also have to remember that even if we don't prove there to be bias on the bench or that, I mean, the, the, the test for bias is that a reasonable observer will consider the um, that there might be bias. So that is the test for the removal, the recusal, because justice has to be seen to be done. But let's say this. You know, we are all products of our culture. Judges are products of their culture. Even judges, it's not, they are not sitting there, um, the total bastions of neutrality. If they are being taught equality and diversity in a particular way, as they are, then the way in which they think is moulded by that ideology. And we've seen in schools, we've seen... Um, in government, which the reason why this ideology has had such a grip and so many of our children have been socially transitioned across a decade is because the medical authorities, the government authorities, the schools authorities, the mm. all said it is best to do this. So mm. the people that we trust and the judges confirmed it. So the mm. people that we trust to do right, the medics, the schools, the local authorities, parliamentarians, the judges, they're all saying, let's gender affirm. And the people that they get to come in and teach people how to teach or how to judge or how to do medicine are people like Stonewall and Mermaids mm -hmm. and Educate mm -hmm. and Celebrate mm -hmm. who are looking increasing, well, they some of them have closed, they look increasingly biased, increasingly mm. ideological, and yep. unlike the evidence that we heard in Felix and Gole, mm. there there is no evidence to back up their claims. Well, so interesting on the question of evidence. One thing that did come up in the cast review is that the adult gender clinic services thwarted attempts for research to be done. They actually refused. To participate and to be—they were unhelpful. The actual yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, this is really bad. I mean, it's it's nine thousand cases that they refuse to disclose to CAS, and the government's very upset about it. I and mean, I think the leaders ought to resign over this. To be quite honest, you know, they, they ought to lose their jobs over it. I mean, how can you refuse to participate in an independent review um, into your services? You, you mean, you know, this is why the government's now launching another review, or the, the NHS is saying we're going to launch another review into delivery of adult care, and they're basically told, written to every. Uh, clinic saying you must you must comply with this you must tell us the outcomes you must show us what is happening and be prepared to cooperate with it um so that that is a very interesting point though ben what have they got to hide if they had to, they had nothing to hide why would they not participate you know you think it's very interesting because you know we've had this scandal now with the w path um um scheme the, the which is a kind of transgender um scheme medical scheme that's been sort of um, exposed um, that people were prescribing puberty blockers knowing that they're damaging the children and so on. And you wonder how much of that will be exposed um, if we actually see more of these clinical records and, and more distress and more of people um, you know, regressing their transgender and so on. And there's been no research into this and so on. How much? How many people are detransitioning? How many people are more depressed when they transition than they were before? And so on. These are the real questions that we've got to get to the bottom of. And the fact they wanted to hide it shows they feel they've got something to hide, I think. And sadly, uh, you, you know, we, James Caspian, as we mentioned earlier, do, do, trying to do the research on detransitioners, more and more testimonies are coming out of the victims of this ideology, those mm -hmm. who 
whose bodies have been mutilated, um, we praise the Lord that um, that no one is too broken or too wounded to receive the blessings of the gospel. Um, we've walked alongside Peter Benjamin, um, who transitioned um, and had all kinds of issues going on, which no one stopped to stopped him. Well, to I think his it. story is particularly tragic because I mean he talks very plainly. I mean we talk about children uh, being socially transitioned and being put onto puberty blockers and so on. But even he will say that he didn't have the counselling. There were all sorts of issues that were going on and that he had one session and, and it was clear that he was presenting in, 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 in terms of the Charing Cross clinic. And then it was, and then he, he had the, the operation and within 30 minutes, he woke up, he said he felt elated. Within 30 minutes, he was thinking, what have I done? And when he went home to his bed sit, hmm. he was alone. He was devastated. Hmm. I mean, this is this is the truth. The, there are does... more stories emerging. I mean, I read David Hayton's book recently as well, and and you know, he he transitioned to a woman, and you get the impression that he almost regrets it now. You know, and it's quite sort of graphic and disturbing reading about the surgery and the effects and all the medical treatment and all the continued pain and discomfort for many weeks afterwards and so on. You know, it's it's not a pleasant thing. And the, the uh, people presenting this as a panacea will help you. You'll feel so much happier. You've got many, you're just introducing more health problems and you're damaging people's bodies. It's, it's awful, really. Um, well, there's, there's videos uh, in various places, the documentary Transformed, um, documents the harrowing stories of many who've detransitioned. Um, but I guess, shockingly, through all of this, um, Andrea, Tim, you guys, Christian and Sam, have been speaking about this for a while. And Andrea, in particular, we, uh, I was a, a memory from a number of years ago came back of your interview with Philip Schofield when you were hounded as intransigent and from the medieval ages for basically saying what the cast review says. <laughs> um, uh, but where has the church been? In fact, we know we've talked a lot about valuing all God's children. Um, the Church of England has basically been promoting the social transition of children, has basically uh, not done anything to stand up against this injustice. And for adults, the Church of England actually promotes and celebrates the transition. And that includes the evangelical bishops. As far as I'm aware, no bishops are opposing the current guidance. But actually under an evangelical bishop, sadly, yeah, who's, that, who uh, initially gender, welcomed it. But gender-affirming liturgy was introduced. Yeah, which celebrated... Not, and the thing is, we can't hide behind it was too hard, it was difficult. This is not hard. This is not... Truth is not hard. Tr speaking the truth on it is not hard. With Gen speaking Genesis 1, made in the image of God, is not a difficult thing for a bishop to do or for someone that really, really loves the Lord. You know, the world can bring, put enormous pressure on us, but but the courageous thing, the right thing to do <clears throat> in order to bring the life and the light that is in Christ to bear is to speak the truth and to speak it from the beginning. Well, and it's worth just reiterating, though, because people won't know and people don't know, you know, this is a liturgy to affirm someone's gender transition as a moment of spiritual renewal. I and mean, it is it is almost blasphemous it's extraordinary no, it, it is it blasphemous. Is. one of the suggested readings is um second corinthians how in christ we're a new creation um and i you know i i'm on general synod i am in the church of england and i you know i, I kind of think yes fine there's these battles going on with the prayers of love and faith but we have bishops who are supporting people mutilating their bodies and on a path of destruction, um, and yet I, I don't understand why we had, didn't break communion then, why we didn't seek alternative spiritual oversight, why we didn't stop giving to our diocese back then. Um, and then, sadly, then it, the goes second... long, it goes way before then. And, but, and... It, 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 but I mean, so, so, so that, 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 that is, and that again is part, you know, this is, but this is also part of you say, why, where is the church? Um, these things, we can be speaking here on a Friday lunchtime 
um, on these issues. And we and we three are living in it day day by day. And mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I've been living in it for more than thirty years. Um, but and I and I may have been seeing things very clearly for 30 years and speaking things very clearly for 30 years. But a lot of these things happen bit by bit by bit. So a Joshua Sutcliffe case one one week, a Nigel and Sally Roki case another, these case last, cases lasting years and years and years. Phoenix and Gole's case, I am beginning to forget the years in which all these cases occurred. And because I didn't refresh my mind before coming on, uh, before, before we recorded, I couldn't remember exactly when the Felix and Gole case started. I think it's been going on for about eight years in total. And so the truth is, these things happen bit by bit by bit. And, and, and what surprises, and of course, I'm thinking this must be so loud and clear to the church. But it's as if they don't join it up. Of course, it's as if nothing is joined up when the gospel attack is so, to me, so glaringly evident. It is mm. literally on who are you? Who mm. are you? Are you mm. made in the image of God, male and female? But, you know, on God's ordinances. So, um, But we can take some encouragement from this report, can't we? Angie, that um, you know the the fruit, as you said, some of it is from standing up. People like Dan Nigel, Sally Rowe, and many others as well, who have challenged this, are now being vindicated. And those people who have supported um, affirming children in the wrong gender are, you know, now you know now on the wrong side of history. When they kept saying they were on the right side of history, we're on the wrong side. Of, they're now on the wrong side of history in this. And you know, truth will out in the end. Truth will come out in the end. Here it is coming out we need to pray and hope it stands we need more people to stand up and and speak the truth and say the truth and so on but this is a, a landmark moment and it marks a significant turning around of the whole transgender I think agenda I'm gonna say, in Tim, our country it does and i think we were long ago we wrote the book new normal well, yes. how old was that book 15 years ago um, exposing Not that long. Eight, eight years ago eight years eight years see, see this this is where i'm getting timings all uh, all over the place We've been on this for 15 years, generally. I remember speaking back in 2004 mm. on this issue around the Gender Recognition Act. So that's 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We at Christian Concern have been speaking about it. Yeah. I, so mm. I really want to say to the Christian Concern family here, well done to you. Mm. I want to say well done to this team. Well mm. done because we have served everyone that's come through our doors with a story on this and who's been lost their jobs or found themselves in trouble as a result of this. We've done our very best to help those that have come and our very best to stand true in the parliamentary space, in the Church of England Synod space, in the church space more widely to educate the church. We've sought mm -hmm. to help those that are confused as a result of gender transitioning. We've sought to, to help the educating authorities to do the right thing. We've helped, sought to help schools to do the right thing. Mm. We have stood. So we have standing is winning. And that is what we've done. We have spoken the, the truth of Christ into this situation for many, many years. So I want to say, uh, what I want to say is well done to us at Christian Concern. Well done to the Christian Concern team. Well done because we have provided the safe place, the actual safe place to stand and to proclaim and to keep on proclaiming. When it wasn't popular, when you were being vilified in the media as well, Andrea, and you know, thank you to well, you. I mean, it's not even, um, there's a sense in which I know that the, the Philip Schofield inter, uh, interview um, catches something, but it's in the courtrooms where no one's looking. Hmm, you know, actually, hmm. that's even harder. It's in the corridors of power, or it's even being written off. You know, let's. I'm. I applaud the gender critical feminists and and all of that. But you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Society likes. I'm content that that and pleased that they are brave on this. Hmm. You know, I'm pleased about all of that. But let's remember. It was his people, God's people, that saw this first ahead of time and mm. spoke it. Mm. And mm. that we have stood and made that ground and made that ground in law, 
in the media and in parliament and in our education systems. We have done that. We have done that. And even and we need to acknowledge that. And others need to acknowledge that. This is not about me now trying to even mm -hmm. trumpet what we have done. Sometimes we we are not we 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 hold back because it's not it's not something that we do. But I we were the groundbreakers and we were the sustainers of the argument and we are still sustaining it because we're in the middle of a multiple life cases on this issue. Mm -hmm. Andrea, thank you. I think that's a, a helpful way to, to finish uh, as we think about, yeah, we've been battling, journeying for many, many years. We praise the Lord, there seems to be a shift, uh, but ultimately we need a shift that points to the freedom and the hope and the forgiveness and the liberation that we have in the gospel. Uh, of Jesus Christ and so yes we're thankful for the gender critical feminists and what they're doing but um, they don't go far enough in pointing to the radical solution that there is only in in Jesus Christ uh, thank you Andrea thank you Tim thank you all for for joining uh, today thank you for your comments and questions uh, we haven't been able to get to all of them uh, but we hope that you have uh, been encouraged by the developments in the cast review and that you yourself will be able to go out to be faithful and fruitful. And if you don't know Jesus Christ and his beautiful, glorious gospel that welcomes the broken, that welcomes sinners to be uh, forgiven, justified, but also to be transformed. And we are thankful that God meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us as we are. And that is true whether we identify as LGBT or not. That's whether we struggle with gender dysphoria or homosexuality or not. God comes and rescues us, not just from the guilt of our sin, but also from the power of our sin. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Andrea. And we'll see you next week on Round the Table. Thank you, ma'am.